Hi everyone, Randy Lilson, Chief Marketing Officer at Conga, and today I am pleased to be joined by Matt Parks, and we are going to be talking about digital transformation. So Matt, let's start with this. As your title suggests, you lead digital transformation. Can you define digital transformation? And importantly, how do you measure value from such an effort? Yeah, hey Randy. Um, yeah, so I guess over the last 20 plus years, um, I've been involved and in leading a number of digital optimizations and major digital transformations. Um, I guess every single one of those is different and uh, they're all hard in their own kind of special ways, but there's definitely a set of common challenges that, that need to be addressed in a proactive way. Um, so you don't kind of end up deploying a new shiny system, but kind of managing you know, the old process still. So, so when I think about digital transformation and kind of the need, um, I very much recognize where an organization fundamentally wants to change the way they operate. Um, and, and, and the goal and the aim is to better serve the customer and the colleague or the employees within that organization. That's very likely to touch a whole host of things across that organization in terms of the business processes being operated, the culture, the organization design, roles and responsibilities, operating model, kind of the list goes on. Um, but absolutely, there is a tech technology element as well. Um, and it, in my experience, technology can be a great catalyst um, and an enabler for change. Um, but, you, but you really need to be careful um, to ensure the project doesn't become too tech, tech-led um, or kind of become all about the technology. It's really important that the transformation um, you know, makes sure it's solving real customer or colleague challenges and, and just not putting a new system in for the sake of it. So that's kind of how I think about digital transformation. In terms of measuring value, I guess the first point I'd make is it's so important to, to capture those metrics and think about those metrics up front. Um, and I guess, guess get that baseline. Um, so you can continuously then measure the progress through the transformation. But then once the transformation is complete, you can do that kind of before and after comparison. In, in terms of the, the, the amount of metrics or the kind of range, I would, I would always encourage a balanced view. In any large transformation, there's many different personas and, and roles, both at the customer and within the organization that, that will reap those benefits. So it's important that the metrics cover all, all the bases, really. Um, in terms of some examples of metrics that I expect to see, I guess in the, in the customer side, you would expect to see uh, net promoter score or, or CSAT metrics to really measure the impact you are having on that customer experience or the customer relationship. Um, from an employee perspective, time saved, a, a right first time metric, but also increasingly talent retention. Um, individuals and employees want to use tools um, like they experience in their consumer life. And if people get bogged down and, and frustrated by these tools, that they could leave the organization. So capturing data from exit interviews or employee surveys is really valuable. And then the final few in terms of metrics around cost savings, revenue generation um, are, are obviously very important metrics and, and benefits to watch. So, so to conclude, I guess I would say that metric wise, you can go really blind on, on this stuff when if you have too many. So I would recommend having sort of a top pick your top five metrics um, that are fundamental to your transformation and really make sure they're visible in everything you do um, and, and, and track, track them through, through the life of the project and beyond. So clearly leading one of these initiatives is a big change for a company. What best practices can you share on how to manage change and drive adoption? Yeah, yeah I, so certainly I, I think we all recognize that, that change is difficult, um, but that doesn't mean people are uh, kind of unwilling to change. I always, I always use the example of someone being asked to move a desk in an office. 
if I just came up to you, Randy, and sort of said, right, I need you to move to this part of the office. I know you've been comfortable there for the last five years, but you're moving. You're probably going to want to push back um, because you're comfortable there, right? However, if I asked you to be part of a pilot uh, that's trying a new office layout and there's kind of complimentary breakfast every morning, you'd be a lot more interested in that change and, and, and less resistance. And really transformations have the same challenge. We're asking employees to work differently, use new tools. Unless we can articulate clearly and in a compelling manner what's in it for them, um, they're going to struggle to engage or or get on board or or even be negative. And if they're kind of connected or influential in the organization, that can be really damaging. So in, in terms of change management best practice, I always advocate getting ahead of the change. That's so important. Um, and really kind of acknowledging that this is much more about people's emotions as opposed to the, the new shiny system or the new features that we might be delivering. So I know there's hundreds of different change management models out there, but I, I always kind of relate to a change curve that very much talks to those emotions. Um, and, and, and recognizes that initially there's this kind of anticipation that you want to build up. Um, and it's important that you lay out a clear vision, you know, really identify those change advocates to, to drive that anticipation. Then as you move into that next phase, typically you want to set up the organization so they're, they're happy to explore and understand more about the transformation the organization is going on. So really kind of answering that question around how could this help me? Um, if, if your project and your program is successful in kind of answering that question, then you've really established that set of champions and promoters that can be so powerful as you push that out into the organization. And and you're looking to then create this kind of hope uh, that the program's really going to make a difference and change you know, my life or change the customer's life. And again, if you if you take people on that journey and continue to answer those questions, you get to a point where the whole organization is kind of committed and, and rallying around the change. And that's really when you get that smooth path uh, in, into, into live and, and, and a successful launch. But fair, fair to say that that is definitely the happy path. Uh, it doesn't always go quite as smoothly as that. Um, but you want to kind of aim to take the, the organization on that journey. And hopefully the majority of the community kind of really get on board. But I guess where there are still detractors, people that are uncomfortable with the change, I think it's important to really zoom in and and support them and put your arm around them. Um, But then sometimes there is the requirement to have that more kind of top-down kind of mandate and sponsorship to really take those final people over the line. Um, And I I like to talk about a carrot-flavoured stick, um, which obviously points to those benefits, but it is very much um, pushing people towards the change that the organization needs to take on. So most companies through these initiatives are really trying to streamline and simplify processes. And you alluded to that even with some of the KPIs that you talked about earlier. That's hard enough to do. But then you talk about mergers and acquisitions and they add a new complexity to this. So What have you experienced over the years? What best practices would you share about how do you simplify and streamline in a process like this, taking into account mergers and acquisitions? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, complexity and lack of standards um, hurts both the customer experience, um, but also the colleague experience and the kind of manual exception processes that need to be managed. So the more you can drive out that complexity, the better. Um, so I guess in these transformational type projects, you really do want to look closely at current processes, really understand how the organization is, is um, operating today um, and what they're looking to achieve. W- what I see a lot is teams uh, are, are kind of looking to achieve the same outcome, but typically working in a different way just because they've been within their silos and 
Um, they thought that was the right way to work, but actually um, there, there's, a, there's an opportunity to standardize. So in, in terms of driving forward a simpler, kind of more standard model, once you've understood those goals and those high-level processes, I like to fold in um, a SaaS solution. So bring in some technology to that conversation because typically these – whatever – kind of process you're looking to automate or manage, there is typically a kind of best of breed or SaaS uh, solution that lives and breathes that process. So if you can kind of bring that to life and, and understand what what does that process look like out of the box uh, to remain vanilla um, and, and reduce any of those customizations, then the organization is going to get a much better win and 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 benefit a lot more from that implementation. So whether it's a forecasting process or whether it's RFPs or, or contract lifecycle management, if you can adopt that standard process that you get out of the box and take your organization on that journey, you're going to have a much simpler life. If we then kind of talk to M&A, which, as you say, is it, you know, for some organizations is a, is a kind of constant theme. Um, my, my, my advice is always um, be very clear on what is your standard template, what are the processes, and how do you work within your organization. And as you, as you onboard a new company or a new acquisition, really try and drive towards that standard template um, and, and standardize kind of on the way your organization operates. Clearly, it's, it's important to continue to learn and evolve that, that template. Um, and, and where appropriate, you can extend that template if, if the new organization has some kind of compelling uh, improvements that can be made. But that it should be the exception rather than the rule. And you certainly don't want to start with a blank piece of paper um, really drive towards that standard template would be my guidance. So clearly today, companies rely on data increasingly to make decisions. So through a digital transformation project, how have you established good data management, data governance practices throughout a project like that? Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that establishing those solid master data foundations are just so important, whether it's customer data product data, employee data, they're all increasingly important to join up uh, all of the dots or all of the kind of islands of information that we now see across kind of all large organizations. Um, I'm always very kind of cautious when, when companies, for example, would demo like an awesome visualization or a dashboard, maybe a vendor trying to sell some new technology uh, and um, the, the company getting excited about what that can bring. But actually, that visualization is just kind of the thin layer on top of data that's been linked. Um, and unless you get those foundations right, you're really going to struggle to get the right insights. Um, I mean, my experience, typically the employee data is managed well um, through those kind of HR uh, systems, but customer and product I still see a lot of, of that being scattered around an organization in the different silos. Uh, and clearly, if you're transforming your organization, you have to create that single version of the truth in order to join up uh, those processes, create a smooth customer experience, and deliver those insights an organization wants uh, when, when, when partnering and, and, and engaging with customers. In, in terms of how you establish that master data strategy and, and the implementation, again, it's, it's super tough. It really does need that top-down um, sponsorship to get these things moving because initially the, the, the organization will not see much value from those kind of initial systems that have adopted the master data but what you then start to see as more and more parts of your organization align on customer and product data, then you get that tipping point. And as more and more systems adopt, they get more and more insights as the, the kind of the world and the ecosystem within your organization starts to get joined up. 
So any digital transformation initiative will fail if it doesn't ultimately meet the needs of the customers. Yet during a project, there are so many different priorities and so many tensions pulling it in all sorts of different directions. How do you stay focused on the customer through a project like this? Yeah, ab- absolutely. The, the voice of the customer is, is so critical and, as you say, can often get kind of drowned out with the, the sort of internal facing conversations and the complexity of process. So, yeah, I would always very much advocate for assigning and kind of ensuring we have enough um, voices of the customer, whether that's people champions internally, or of course, absolutely bringing the customer in in terms of interviewing or or gathering insights from the customer just to keep keep that dynamic and keep that that regular. In in terms of an approach I like to take is, is to adopt that design thinking approach, which initially sort of empathizes with the with the customer needs with the user needs then really kind of defines what they are and documents them in a clear way then you use that information to to kick around ideas kind of think really broadly in terms of options solution options to address those customer needs then go into that iterative prototype test and learn approach with the customer so you're kind of co-developing a solution with the customer and ensuring they continue to have that voice. As you get to a point where you've got a solution that you can actually put out uh, and customers can touch, I would very much uh, advocate beta customers. So again, keep that dialogue going, test and learn and kind of really capture feedback uh, to ensure that the the product or the solution is being uh, continuously uh, designed and evolved with the customer's voice uh, front and center. And then finally, I would say once you have launched uh, a, a product or a portal or a, some sort of solution, it's really important to ensure that you have those feedback channels continued continuously embedded into the product or, or, or the, the relationship. So we've used surveys and kind of in-app um, kind of messaging to really ensure uh, that, you, that you capture that feedback and can continue to respond and listen to what your customers are saying. Matt, thank you for sharing the insights and thank you for joining us. We invite you to learn more at conga.com.